Uh, let's bring in former U.S. attorney and senior FBI official Chuck Rosenberg. Uh, Chuck, let's just talk about um, Trump's surrender and the bond that he's going to make and his co-defendants. What's the likelihood he helps his co-defendants out? What's the likelihood his co-defendants actually make bond? What's the process beyond that for the former president? Right, Mika, lots of good questions. So the likelihood that he helps anybody but himself, I think is relatively small. These bonds require only 10% down. So I don't think it's going to be all that difficult for each of his co-defendants to meet that threshold. Um, and it's a fairly standard, fairly typical way of making bond. There's a similar statutory scheme in the federal system. I want to make one observation, and I think it's keeping with the theme uh, so far this morning uh, at the top of this hour. There was a wonderful federal judge in the Eastern District of Virginia where I practice, uh, Albert V. Bryan Jr. He was on the bench for almost 50 years, his father before him for almost 40. Uh, and I was arguing once at a detention hearing that a defendant was a risk of flight not to be held. And Judge Bryan wryly observed that the real problem with that particular defendant was not that he was a risk of flight, but that he was a risk of non-flight. He just wouldn't go away. Um, and that makes me think a bit about Mr. Trump, uh, that maybe he'll go to another country with whom we don't have extradition, and Georgia will keep his $20,000, and we'll call it even. Chuck, you know, oh about the, uh, you know, the defendant who won't go away, we have another defendant who won't go away, seemingly, that we're talking about here every day. And his lawyers have asked for a court date three years out, three mm. years from now. Mm. Uh, that might provoke a sense of humor in a federal judge or a sense of outrage in a federal judge. Where do you think that's going to go? Yeah, uh, you know, my judges hear a lot of outrageous things, and I don't think they are outraged by it normally. Um, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. It's not a reasonable request. The Speedy Trial Act actually promises a speedy trial to both sides, not just the defendant. We often think of it as a one-sided um, opportunity for a defendant to receive a speedy trial. But the public has a right as well, and the public is represented by prosecutors in court. Uh, and so I don't think that's going to fly, Mike, nor should it. Um, it's going to be very hard, if not impossible, to try four cases before the election. But it's not impossible to try one or two. Uh, and the federal judges uh, know this. They control their dockets. They control their courtrooms. Uh, and as I learned, being a prosecutor in the Eastern District of Virginia, the rocket docket, it, this stuff can move expeditiously. We just need judges to do that. And that request made by the Trump team was for the case, the federal case in Washington, not the one in Atlanta. So, Chuck, let me ask you about some of the conditions of this bond and how exactly they would impose penalties, how the court would impose penalties against Donald Trump if he violated them, talking about not intimidating witnesses, not intimidating co-defendants, not reposting anything that might be suggestive of any of those things, intimidation. Let's say he posts something today on True Social about a co-defendant, about a witness, as he's done before. He was attacking the DA, Fonny Willis, last night on True Social, but she's not, I guess, included in mm. these restrictions. What if he does? What if he goes after a witness? What can the court do exactly? Yeah, a judge in any court has a series, Willie, of punishments they can impose from things that are relatively mild to things that are relatively severe. Now, what's really hard here is that the man is running for president, and so he's entitled to speak as a candidate. But speaking as a candidate doesn't include threatening witnesses. And so, you know, there are a series of graduated punishments. A judge could issue a gag order. A judge could find someone in contempt. A judge could revoke bond. Or, worst case scenario, there's power that the prosecutors have. We saw the indictment uh, concerning the classified information, Willie, in southern Florida in federal court. And then it was superseded with count additional counts of obstruction of justice. If Mr. Trump doesn't heed his obligations and continues to threaten and intimidate witnesses, not only can the judge impose additional sanctions, but prosecutors could theoretically supersede an indictment with witness intimidation charges. So, look, 
This is a tough, tough place for a judge to be because you want to be on the right side of Mr. Trump's First Amendment rights and um, permit him his political speech, but you want to protect the integrity of the judicial process and ensure that witnesses are not threatened or harassed. Um, it's almost like Justice Potter Stewart said in a 1960s obscenity case in the Supreme Court. You know it when you see it. Witness intimidation and witness harassment are on the wrong side of the line. If he continues to do that, I believe, Willie, there will be additional sanctions. Mm -hmm. You never know. That might be why his attorneys might have been able to convince him not to do the debate. Uh, former former yeah. U.S. Attorney Chuck Rosenberg, thank you.